let's see. Just gonna open up the chat so I can see it here. Okay. Um, so, uh, all right. So I'm Maureen Babb. I'm one of the librarians at the WRHA Virtual Library. I'm assuming since I haven't heard that nobody can see my screen that you can all see the screen and that you can all see me and hear me at this point. Um, so to get started, uh, I'm going to talk about what I'll be doing here. I'm going to briefly describe the virtual library and its services for those of you who aren't familiar with it. I'm going to introduce Google Scholar. I'm going to describe some effective search techniques for Google Scholar. Now, I want to be clear that there are more search techniques than I discuss here. Um, some of them we also discussed in an earlier webinar that you can find on the virtual library page under services, uh, library training webinars. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the features of Google Scholar in addition to the searching. And I'm going to identify some problems and issues that you should keep in mind when you're using Google Scholar. And then I'm going to indicate how to use Google Scholar in conjunction with the WRHA virtual library. Um, so uh, the WRHA virtual library, uh, for those of you who don't know, it provides electronic resources and library services for WRHA staff, staff of eligible care homes, uh, and eligible community health agencies. Um, we provide access to a lot of different online resources, Medline, CINAHL, um, um, several databases, several eBooks, um, and we also have library services. So we'll do literature searching for you. We'll do document delivery for you. I'll talk a little bit about in that. I'll talk a little bit about that in this webinar. And we do education and training sessions like this one, but we'll also do them on demand um, if you want us to present to a group or just to you personally. Um, so what is Google Scholar? Well, it's a search engine, and I'm sure all of you have used Google at this point. It's very similar. The website for Google Scholar is scholar.google.ca. Feel free to open that up and follow along if you're if you're able to, but don't feel compelled to, you, there's, there's no mandatory following along or participation in this webinar. Um, and so Google Scholar collects resources, it sends out little crawlers, and it collects resources from publishers, professional societies, scholarly repositories, universities, things that just look scholarly. Um, and the content tends to include articles, presentations, patents, and case laws. Uh, but there are other things that periodically show up. Books sometimes do, for example, but not consistently. So if you're looking for books, this isn't the Google Scholar isn't really the place to look for. It's much better for articles, uh, which is what I'll be focusing on in this webinar. Um, so I've done a search here uh, for COVID-19 just to show you what it looks like. So you can see there's uh, general listing of results. It tells you what type of material it is. It's an HTML page or it's a PDF, and that's just at the front of the, the article. Um, it also, there's also, um, shoot. Uh, over here in the left-hand corner, there's uh, limits that you can add. So you can sort by date, you can limit to a certain year range. And you'll notice that one of the things about Google Scholar, like Google, is that it has just an absolute ton of results. Um, so when you are building your Google Scholar search, you probably want to be more specific than just COVID-19, for example. Um, it, in this case, it provided uh, over a million results. Um, and as you know, COVID-19 hasn't been around all that long, so uh, you can imagine what it's like for other topics. So, in, so here's some search tips to help you um, improve your, the quality of the results of, uh, that you get from Google Scholar. Um, as I say, there, these aren't all of them. Um, there's basically anything that works for Google works for Google Scholar. And a few things that wouldn't work for Google work for Google Scholar as well. But in general, the rules of Google apply. Um, Google searching, there are some standard things. There are some things that are sort of secret that you can do searches with. I won't be talking about those so much. Um, and then there are ones that 
used to work that don't work anymore. So it's always it's always shifting. I've just tested these ones today to make sure they all still work. So these ones are fine. Um, but because it is a proprietary software and program where we don't get to see the back end, it's sort of up to other people to discover these. Google doesn't always release all of them uh, for people to find. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that word order matters. Uh, the earlier the words are in your search string, the more important they're considered by the Google algorithm. Um, so if, if you're searching for dementia and COVID-19 or something like that, and dementia is the important part, the most important part, then you want to put dementia first in that word order. Um, if you want to search for an exact term, uh, you want to put it in quotes like so. So for instance, if we take a look at Louie body dementia, that looks for the words Louie and body and dementia, but not necessarily them together as a, a, a term. Now the term is so common that it might functionally work that same way anyways, but Louie body dementia in quotes looks for Louie body dementia that term. Uh, so if we take a look, Louie body dementia comes up with these results, Louis body dementia in quotes comes up with these results and there's some overlap the second I mean it, quite a bit more results than what I show here but you can see the the number of results differs between the two uh, you can see that there's overlap the second article is the same but the first one isn't so that you can you can get a sense that what you're pulling up with exact quotes is different than what you're pulling up with the the individual terms um, so as you may have uh, implied from the from me saying that it searches for Louis and body and dementia if it doesn't have quotes around it. The default is and when you do a search. If you search for a word, Google assumes you are looking for this word and this word and this word and this word, um, and it will try to find articles that have all of them in general. If you are looking for, say, dementia and Alzheimer's and you don't want to look for articles that refer to both dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, you want to put or or the little pipe uh, symbol which is just located above your backslash key on your keyboard. Um, uh, and if you use the pipe you don't put a space around it you do Alzheimer's pipe dementia and that's the same as doing Alzheimer's or dementia and in that case it will look for anything that has the word dementia in it or anything that has the word Alzheimer's in it. Now, Google Scholar, when it does this, it tries to sort things according to its algorithm based on importance, but it is looking at the entire text of the document that it can see. Um, so it's not just looking in the title or the abstract, it's looking in the entire thing. So in theory, if it's not a very common term, you might get things where you're like, I don't know why this is coming up at all. And the reason it's coming up is because somewhere in there are the terms you're looking for. Um, so again, that specificity is important. It helps you limit things uh, that could be pulled up that are completely irrelevant when it's searching through all of the, the text of the entire document. Um, if you want to exclude a specific term, you can use this little minus sign. Um, so for instance, if you're looking for information on nursing, but you're not talking about breastfeeding, you're talking about like nursing, um, you can do nursing minus breastfeeding, and that should remove all the terms or all the results that have breastfeeding. Now, one of the things about using the minus or um, it's, it's a Boolean not functionality, it's the same thing as saying not, um, is that you want to make sure that you're not limiting your results too much, and that can sometimes happen. So that's always a judgment call. Uh, we tend to be very careful about using the minus sign or the not because you can remove things of relevance. But in terms of Google Scholar, because the number of results are so high, use it liberally. I use it all the time. Uh, this is one of those ones that, again, it can be used in regular Google and is very handy for removing, for instance, if you don't want results from a certain web page or something like that, you just put in your search term minus the web page that you're looking, uh, that you keep seeing results from that you don't want to. Um, now, Google Scholar and Google in general, they automatically include variations of terms. So for instance, if you put in the term feed, it's also searching feeding, feeder, feeders, all that sort of thing. If you want to counter that and say, no, no, I'm only interested in the term feed specifically, 
then you would put that term in quotes and that stops that, that uh, inclusion of variations of terms. Um, you can also search, and this one I find very useful for Google Scholar in particular, uh, because it, it limits things in a way that is beneficial because academic titles tend to be descriptive. Um, so if you use the term in title, uh, it will only look for things in, for those words in the title of the document. Um, so you would put your search term and then you'd, or you'd put in title and then you'd put your search term. And if you wanted more than one word to be found in the title, again, use the, use the phrase. And if you want, you know, multiple terms, you can combine it with the, the or or the pipe or whatever. You can combine any of these things into ridiculously long search strings. Uh, don't worry about Google's um, processing power. You're not going to overload it. They have much processing power. Um, you can also search for a specific author. In that case, you just do author colon name. You can do the last name. You can do the whole name if you want. Um, but often academic journals won't necessarily include anything more than a first initial. Um, so be cautious of that as well. You can also limit to a certain type of file. Uh, if you're only interested in PDFs, if you're only interested in PowerPoint presentations, so file type colon PDF, file type uh, colon doc, file type colon PPT, all that sort of thing. Um, so these are some, some handy search tips. There are many more out there. I'm not going to go through too many of them because these are, in my opinion, the most useful ones. Um, so one of the other things to have a look at if you're going through this is that in your search results in the top left hand corner there, uh, you can access the advanced search and the advanced search allows you to do many of the things we've discussed here. You can see they can ask about specific exact phrases, exact words, um, and those are uh, things that's basically the equivalent of quotes. You can see without the words, that's the equivalent of the minus symbol. Uh, you can see words that occur anywhere in the article or in the title of the article, authored by, uh, published in, so that would be the journal that you want to put it in, or that you want to include things in, uh, dates between, that can be controlled on the far side otherwise. Um, but it doesn't include, for example, the file type option that I talked about there. Um, so, but if you find this easier, by all means, just go to those little uh, sandwich menu at the top there and click on that and uh, click on advanced search and you'll be taken here. Um, so one of the things that I find tremendously useful about Google Scholar is citations. Um, so if you've got an article, uh, here's one that I've just pulled from the list of what we're talking about, you can click on this, these two little quotation marks, and what this will show you is different ways of citing the article. Um, so you can get it in an MLA, APA, Chicago, Harvard, and Vancouver style. These are the options they give. Um, you can also, at the bottom there, export it to one of your reference managers, such as EndNote, RefWorks, um, or you can import it in formats that are readable, by, or sorry, export it by formats that are readable by most uh, reference management software, um, in the RefMan, which will export as RIS, and BibTeX, which will export as TXT, I believe. Um, but you can also do something called forward citations. Now, forward citations, backward citations, um, are if you pull up an article, it's really useful, you want to see what else there is, you just go to the reference list of the article and you see what they cited right? Like what did they use to create this article? And that's very useful. But with Google Scholar, you can do the opposite. You can see forward citations, i.e. what articles have cited this article that you found so useful, and probably those will be very useful as well. So if you click on this uh, cited by, in this case, 694, it will take you to a list of um, articles that have cited this article. Um, and then you can keep stringing that along and find very useful things. You can also search within the citing articles. Um, if you're, you know, when you've got huge amounts of citations like this, um, sometimes you'll get 
you know, just throw away citations and it turns out the articles aren't very useful, but you can do the search within citations to look for certain terms that you think would be useful to whatever it is you're studying, or um, you can go to the article itself and if you click Control F, that is find or on a Mac, Command F, um, which is find, you can put in a specific term and see how much the article in question talks about what you're interested in. Um, so yeah, forward citation is, is one of my favorite features of Google Scholar. Um, okay, one of the other things that you can do is you can create alerts. So let's say you've done a search COVID-19 and dementia. This isn't one I would suggest create an, creating an alert for because it's very broad. If you're creating an alert, I would suggest uh, doing a very specific search. And so what alerts do is they, they allow you to keep track, keep up to date on topics of interest to you. So if you click on create an alert here, what it will do is it will take you here and it'll say, okay, here's the alert for you. Here's what you're, here's what you're checking. Um, and then they'll send it to your email and you can show they default up to 10 results. You can select up to 20 and then you press create alert and it sends you results. I believe daily is the default, but it might be weekly. Um, as I say, I don't suggest using very broad searches for them. Um, if you're logged into Google, you have the, to a Google account, you have the ability to alter this search later. If you don't, you'd basically just have to, to say, no, I don't want this anymore, and then create a new search that's more specialized and more what you're looking for. But the results will show up in your inbox. I use it, for example, uh, to keep track of, of niche subjects or the names of specific people that I want to know um, if they've published anything or if anything has been published about them. Um, and so I only get those results because they're, they're limited search. I'm not getting them weekly or daily. I'm getting them as those results appear, which tends to be, you know, once every few months or something like that. Um, at the virtual library, we're willing to help you build a search um, to put into an alert that will be more specialized, more limited, um, and and more helpful to you than something as generic as uh, COVID-19 dementia. Um, and so in that case, you can send us an email and, and we'll work through that with you to help you build a good alert <laughs> for you. Um, there's also something called a researcher profile on Google Scholar. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at an article and you'll notice that some of the author's names are underlined, uh, what that means is that they have a researcher profile set up in Google. Um, so see, if we click on this uh, P. Goyle guy, uh, you'll see, okay, well, this is Para Goyle from uh, Cornell Medicine, um, and it's verified, and you can check that out, and then it lists his other articles or their other articles. Um, it also provides information about some of their uh, uh, citation metrics and that sort of thing, um, which I won't get into here. Uh, so this is this can be a way to say like, oh, I was really interested in, in this person's paper. I wonder if they have anything else on the same topic. Well, you can very clearly find that out by going to their, their Google profile if they have one. Um, and if you as a scholar are interested in creating a Google profile for yourself, you can, or a researcher profile for yourself, you can do that and you can set that up. I won't talk about how to do that here, um, just because it's not the point of this seminar, but if you're interested in that, um, feel free to poke around and set it up yourself. It's fairly straightforward, but um, we're happy to walk through it with you. Again, you can contact us at the virtual library and we'll, we'll talk to you about that. Um, but there are some things to be concerned about with Google Scholar um, related to the quality of content. So one of the things that I, I want to, to highlight here is that it is, not a, it is not a database, it is a search engine. Um, it is finding material by sending out um, web crawlers, little bits of code that collect things that look scholarly and pulls it in and says, okay, yeah, this is academic, great, we'll put it in Google Scholar. The content is in no way curated. Um, so what's in there 
It may not be peer reviewed. It may include predatory publishers. Uh, it may include things that aren't scholarly at all that are just hosted on the websites of publishers or universities or um, as, you know, scholarly content. Um, sorry, my cat is meowing. <laughs> um, uh, and then one of the other things to consider is that things like the citation, the ability to cite in APA, MLA format or whatever, or even to import it into your um, reference management software, that stuff is only as good as the metadata that exists for it, that's provided on the website that Google Scholar is searching. Um, and you don't know how good that is. So if you're doing something like pulling the citations off there, Usually they're good, sometimes they're not, uh, but you need to check. Like you need to double check that every time. And that's the same with um, the content in here because you have no idea if it's peer reviewed, you have no idea if it's from a predatory publisher or anything like that. You want to be, I would say extra cautious about looking at the quality of the article as you read through it. Um, and then the other thing that I've hinted at a few times here is that Google runs on proprietary algorithms. We don't know what they are. We have no access to them. Um, so sometimes search tools change. Sometimes it means, and there have been many studies on this, um, it, it affects what comes up first, right? So you might end up getting articles that are, in fact, you know, not only are they, they predatory, they're maybe explicitly racist or something because enough people have looked for that that has pulled it in. And so there's been quite a bit of research into that and, and no clear way on how to deal with that right now. Um, so that's also something to consider. And it's, again, one of the, the reasons that you don't want to be doing these very, very broad searches. You want to be doing specialized searches so that instead of like a million results, you're getting, you know, 40 or something that you can look through reasonably and say like, okay, Yes, I can look through all of these and say, well, this one at the top actually isn't the best one for me. Um, the best ones are farther down. Um, so these are all things to consider. Um, one of the other things that you will notice if you use Google Scholar is that it's, it's not connected to the virtual library and you don't have access to everything. So some things, if we take a look at our Louis body dementia search again, um, if we click on that first article, you'll see, okay, great. It's accessible, it's free, there's a PDF, I can get it, that's fine. But if you go to the second article, well, you come here and you can see the page, you can see the abstract, and then you can see at the top, get access. And if you click on that, there's institutional login uh, options or purchase the PDF. Um, and you now, one of the things, the institutional login, we don't tend to have institutional logins for the virtual library specifically in that way, but also just because we don't necessarily have institutional access through uh, Elsevier, we might have it through, we might have access to the same article through another platform. Um, don't pay this $39.95, just do not do it. What you should do instead is go to the virtual library webpage, that's www.wrhavirtuallibrary.ca, and you'll be taken here. And if you've copied the title of the article and you put it up in this corner in the search our collection and you click on that, you'll be taken here and you can see, okay, there's the article. You'll want to sign in so that you can see the virtual library access options. You click on it. If we have direct access to it, there will be something like, uh, WRHA in front of the, the Elsevier SD backfile medicine and dentistry. In this case, we don't have access to the article directly. The U of M does, and we share a platform with them, which is why you're seeing these things that look like access options that aren't. But even though we don't have direct access to it, you still shouldn't pay that $39.95. What you should do instead is click on WRHA order sources. And at that point, you'll be asked to log in again. Um, but once you've logged in, it'll copy all the information about the journal article, and then you scroll down, accept our terms of service, and click submit, and we will order that article in for you, for free, to you, like it doesn't cost you any money, and we'll send it to you. We save three to five business days on the form, 
realistically, we get it to you much faster, usually within 24 hours. Um, so again, don't pay those $39.95 prices. Check our website, uh, first of all, to see if we have access to it. And then second of all, if we don't, to order it through interlibrary loan. Um, so that is the presentation. I don't have a clock here, so I don't actually know how I've done for time. Oh, I'm pretty close to the pretty close to exactly on time. I've got a few minutes for questions, and I'm happy to stay on for longer. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, I will stay here, but otherwise, uh, feel free to head on out. Thank you for joining me today. I hope it was beneficial. Um, we will be posting this webinar up online so you can watch it again. And for those of you who registered, I will be sending the slides out to you. Um, if you go to the virtual library webpage, we also have a specific page dedicated to Google Scholar that contains some of the information in this webinar. Um, oh, and I have a question. Uh, can you search by article type uh, reviews? Unfortunately, no. Um, but you could, you could sort of get around that by including the term review or systematic review in your search terms. Um, but yeah, Google Scholar doesn't, I think it's down to the fact that it's not a database, but it doesn't have all the, the trimmings of true databases, um, like say Medline. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would get around that by including the term review. Uh, and maybe if, if that's critical to you, I'd put it in quotes and I'd put it at the front. So review in quotes and then your search terms. Um, but I'd have to actually play around with it to see if that works. I, I feel like it should, <laughs> um, but I, I don't know for sure how effective that would be. Um, so again, I will stick around for longer. Um, I'm just going to, while I wait around to see if there are any more questions, my cat is just, he wants attention. So I'm going to give him some while we, while we wait. Um, so, yeah. To the people saying thank you, you are welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you for attending. What do you think, buddy? Is there going to be any more questions? Um, okay. Um, unfortunately, I have no way of seeing if people are typing or not. Um, I see a hand up from Pepper. I'm not sure if that's if that means you have a question or not. It's gone down, so maybe it was just an accident. Um, I'll, I'll stay here for about uh, two more minutes, let's say. And um, if there are any more questions, uh, hopefully you'll get them in in that time. If not, then uh, you can, and, and I cut you off while you're typing, uh, feel free to send me an email um, and I'll, I'll answer it for you uh, as soon as I can. Um, those, uh... <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, the webinar should be up tomorrow, probably, um, and the slides will go out at the same time. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's that's been two minutes since I've said two minutes, so I'm going to head on off. Uh, thank you for attending again, and have a good... Rest of you day. <laughs>